and welcome to an introducting to quilting. In this course, learners will use strategic thinking and reasoning to analyze the information presented and recall and reproduce information from this course, such as supplies needed prior to sewing, the process of sewing a quilt, and what is done with quilts after sewing to pass a quiz at the end of the course with at least 80% accuracy. And here is an introduction to quilting. Quilting is an elaborate hobby that can be artistic, utilitarian, or historic. Quilting has many steps, but finished quilts can last for hundreds of years. It is common for quilts to take hundreds of hours and may even take years to finish. Quilts can be funky and modern and give the impression of something other than fabric, such as this quilt, which is cathedral windows, and the effect that the quilter was going for was stained glass. It's also common for quilters to sign their work with embroidered text, such as in the bottom right-hand corner of this quilt. This image is from the Smithsonian Institute and is entitled Cathedral Window Quilt. This quilt is actually a quilted petticoat or clothing worn by an enslaved woman in the United States. This is from the Smithsonian Institute and is entitled Quilted Petticoat. Quilts can also document and celebrate important milestones such as this quilt from mid-century America. My source is the Smithsonian Institute and this is entitled 48 State Quilt. Before you sew, you'll need to gather your tools and supplies. Here I have a self-healing cutting mat. It's optional, but recommended. Used with a ruler and rotary cut cutter, this is an easy way to make straight, precise cuts. I also have quilt basting spray. This is used to keep the layers of your quilt together while you baste or sew the layers together. This is spray glue. You can use this or you can use quilters safety pins. These safety pins are curved, making it easier to pin through two layers of fabric and one layer of batting. You'll need a ruler of some kind. This clear ruler can be placed over fabric and aligned with a self healing mat below for crisp, accurate cuts. Rotary cutter is optional, but recommended. A rotary cutter and ruler make it easy to make a straight cut through fabric. You'll also need fabric scissors. Never ever use these for anything but fabric or they will become dull and useless. Fabric scissors are usually much more expensive and sharper than normal scissors to make a clean cut through any type of fabric. You'll need sewing needles. If you're sewing by hand, you'll use straight needles. If you're sewing with a sewing machine, use a universal needle. And finally, you'll need thread and a bobbin if you're sewing with a sewing machine. And if you're sewing by hand, you only need thread. Next, we'll make our fabric selections. Most quilts use solid colors for contrast. It's often helpful to pick patterned fabrics before choosing solid either in contrasting or complementary colors. You can choose your patterns any way you wish. Your fabrics may look different when cut up and placed adjacent to one another, so it may be helpful to cut samples and play around with their size and position until you have the look you want. You should limit your fabric selections to three to five fabrics or your quilt can become too busy. Smaller checked quilts, such as this one, can accommodate a large variety of fabrics as long as they are in a repeating pattern. And finally, we have binding choice. You'll need bias tape to bind your quilt edges. You can use leftover fabrics to make your own bias tape or purchase pre-made bias tape or ribbing binding. 
And every good project needs a plan, such as this one. Here I have a rough sketch of the quilt that I had intended to make, but haven't yet. Now that we have all of our supplies, we can begin making blocks. Quilts are made up of smaller blocks that are then sewn together. Blocks can vary in size from a few inches to 12 inches by 12 inches. They typically use a repeating design or pattern. Modern quilts may use only a color for a pat or a pattern or shapes like a large unicorn pieced together by hand. Most quilters arrange their blocks in different ways before deciding on a final arrangement. Here I have a little video to show you, and this is how you can arrange your quilt blocks in different ways and come up with different patterns. Hey everybody, you've got a little bit of extra behind the scenes information from the 2900 series of Love of Quilting. I'm Sarah Gallegos, the new host, and today I've kind of been playing with Toby Lishko with log cabin blocks. Oh, they're so much fun to play with because you can turn them in so many different directions and create so many different kinds of designs. Um, we've created a little puzzle here yeah. with each block and all the blocks are the same. And so then all we have to do now is just turn them in, in different directions to create different designs. New layouts. And we kind of started doing this and sometimes we have so many exciting things to share that we don't get to all of it in our 22 minutes. So we thought we would show you a couple more alternate layouts for the log cabin than what we showed on the episode. Okay, so one is a traditional log cabin layout is, is lightning. And what that does is you have lights going and darks going down in a diagonal direction. So you just move your blocks so that you have your dark going like this and you have your lights fitting in like this and you can fill in those ones down there sure. just put in the lights next to each other and the darks next to each other and there we go yep, that one's in the wrong way sometimes you have to look at them to see what direction you're turning it in and you can do this with your blocks after you've created all the blocks for a project if you don't have these cool little tiles like we have there you go. Or you can print it out on your printer and uh, cut them up into little pieces. You can print out a block on your sure. printer and then just reprint it as many times as you want. Um, you can paste it to uh, some foam core board or yeah. cord bo cardboard or whatever you want to paste it to. And then uh, you could put it on your refrigerator and have your little children play with it. I know. They would have so much fun. Put a little magnet on there. We were saying we could cover them in... Um, Something to make them a little sturdier. You can make the best little coasters and gifts for quilters. Well, that would be a good idea. Coasters you should sell them on your website. Oh, well, now there's one more thing I have to add to my to-do list. I, I, I got a pretty full to-do list, so I don't know if I'd have time to do that. But you can see here we've got it going in like diagonal rows like that. Yeah. So, Or you can start from the center, and you can um, make it kind of like the quilt that I made, but you can start with a dark center in there. You can make little circles with it. Okay, and create little circles yeah. like that. That kind of a fun looking design. Mm -hmm. Makes kind of looks like a flower almost, yeah. I think. I think so too. Let's spin that guy around. And on these log cabin blocks, we talked about how Toby used narrower strips on the outsides and wider strips on the or on the darker colors narrower strips and wider and so strips on the light. It's more of a curved kind of look than just straight diagonal line most log cabins have. Yeah. So there's so many different design possibilities. I mean I could do this all day and just make some fun designs and right. each time I make this quilt I can make it look different. Absolutely. So you can never have to get bored with a log cabin quilt because you can lay it out in a million different ways. So experiment with your log cabin blocks too. So once you've got your blocks arranged the way you'd like, it's time to join them up into rows and join the rows together to form a quilt top. Hello, today I'd like to show you how to gather up your blocks to sew them together into rows ready for making your quilt top. So it's very exciting. You've made all your blocks and now you want to lay everything out 
to see how it's going to go together. Well, now obviously on this design that I've chosen, where I've just done a nine patch, um, it's all going to kind of alternate. I'm alternating it with a, a plain fabric square. But if you were using something that had different blocks or different colors throughout the quilt, you sometimes need to lay them out to make sure that everything is looking right before you sew everything together. And then you want to sew everything together the way you laid it out so that it's not back to front or upside down or something. So this is how I would do my quilt. I would lay it all out and I would number as I look at it. So as you're looking at it on, um, from there, I number the left hand end square or block of my quilt. So I've numbered them in rows starting at the top. I start with number one, number two, number three, obviously number four and five. And I just pin that number on and I leave it on um, as I'm sewing the rows and things together so that I always know that things get a little bit mixed up or if you get interruptions, you haven't finished a job and you know that that's actually row three and that's the end block for it. So it should save some confusion later on um, for some things. So then I've laid it all out, I've numbered my rows, I'm happy with my layout. So now I'm going to pick up my rows and I'm going to just stack them one on top in order with the numbered one at the bottom. And I do that with all of them so that they're all ready to go. And if I'm not sure what row I'm working on, I always know that I can just look at my bottom block and it tells me that that's row number two. Because um, I might be, as I said, interrupted or all sorts of things could happen as you're trying to sew a quilt top together. Uh, things don't always go the way you planned them. Um, and so that's my five rows that I've got here. You might have ten rows, it doesn't really matter. The, the, the method is the same. So that was just how I get them ready. And then I take them to the sewing machine and I sew all my blocks together. So I know that this is my end block and I'm going to sew it to that end of that one. And then I'm going to move it along and sew it to that end of that block until I get to the other end. So that's how I organize myself ready to sew my blocks together. So now I've got my rows sewn together. We had numbered them um, so that I know which row is, is which. So I've got my number one still attached on the left hand end of my row, number two and three, etc. And I'm happy that everything is where it should be. I've pressed my seams so that they're going to alternate when, I'm, when they meet another seam. So here, seams going this way and this one's going that way. So it's a good idea to try and have your seams alternating in direction um, somehow or other so, so that they just snuggle in together when you join them up. So now it's a matter of joining up and we're just using a quarter inch seam allowance. I talk about the quarter inch seam allowance. If you're not sure how to achieve a quarter inch seam allowance, I have covered it in a previous quilting tips and techniques video in video 021. And these nine patches that I've made, you may have seen before if you've been watching, but they were nine patches um, from, a, from Fat Quarters, and that was in a video, Tips and Techniques um, 034. So that's kind of all coming together now. So now I've got to join all my rows together to make my top before I think about borders. So now I've got all the blocks and the rows joined up. So actually I don't need to keep my numbers in any longer. I can take them out. The only time I might leave something in is maybe for me, I like the bottom left hand corner. I might leave that one in if it was a quilt that had a right and a wrong way up for easy recognition when I'm handling it and things. Otherwise, we don't need those numbers anymore. So as you can see, the quilt is all together. Um, it's come in a little bit in size because we've taken in all those seam allowances and now it's ready for me to think about some borders. So we'll come back with another um, tip and technique video about measuring up for your borders. But that's my quilt top all joined up, so into rows and then join the rows together using a quarter inch seam allowance, pressing our seams so that they nestle and labeling the rows to help you keep everything in order. Thank you. So now that we have our quilt tops put together, we need to make the quilt sandwich. This step makes the quilt feel like a quilt. The layers are laid out carefully on a floor or large table, then taped down on the edges. A quilter may use spray adhesive to base the layers together or use quilter safety pins, which are curved to make it easier to pin the layers together. The first step is to lay down your backing. The fabric you've chosen for the back of your quilt is laid down first, right side or pattern or printed side down. If it is wrinkled, iron it. Tape all four corners to the floor and pull tight to eliminate any wrinkles. 
If you are using spray glue basting, spray your fabric now. Your backing should be three to four inches larger than your batting, which should be one to three inches larger than your quilt top. Carefully roll out your batting and smooth it onto the bottom layer of fabric. If you've spray basted, you might need to carefully pick up and lay the batting back down to work out wrinkles due to the glue. Smother out all the wrinkles starting in the center. If you're going to spray baste, spray baste now. Repeat with the quilt top. If you're using safety pins, pin all three layers every three to six inches, depending on your fabric thickness and whether it is likely to slip and slide around like minky or silk will. In summary, the quilt sandwich is the beginning of the second half of the quilting process. The quilt is now recognizable as a quilt. Thanks to Blossom Heart Quilts for this, this series of images. And now we're going to watch three tips for quilting big quilts on a small machine. So this humongous quilt is basted and ready for quilting. And if any of you have actually put together the layers of a sandwich, you know what kind of swearing and struggling went on. But now that it's ready to go, I'm gonna give you some specific tips on how to quilt those large quilts on your sewing machine. I know it can be a bit of a pain, but the gal I'm giving this quilt to is so worth the effort. The first and most important tip to remember is that even though this quilt is really large, I'm only focusing on a small area at one time. So instead of looking at the whole thing, I'm just gonna work in this area and work on the next area until the whole thing is done. In the block, I'm gonna quilt a feather that starts from the corner, and I'm gonna quilt a nice elongated swirl that lands somewhat close to the center of the square. That's gonna act as the spine of my feather because I'm gonna start working my way back around that swirl quilting petal shapes. And these are kind of half heart shapes they're gonna swing out, come close to the edge of the area, and then come back in to the spine. I'm gonna keep quilting those half heart shapes until I make my way along the whole spine returning to my starting point. This design is perfect for tip number two of quilting large quilts on your machine. I wanna pick designs that will fit within the area of my machine. I don't wanna try wrestling the quilt for really long fluid designs. I'm gonna think of it as chunks and quilt to this area and then move on. Whether that's a feather design or an all over design, as long as it fits within the area, it makes it a lot easier to manage. Now I'm gonna start quilting some wavy lines in the background of this area, just to give it a fun look. Starting from one edge, I'm gonna quilt a wavy line to the center block, then travel and quilt another line back to the edge. It's this travel line that makes these wavy lines look as though they're going behind the blocks. Now, as I'm quilting the wavy lines, I'm making it more of a gentle wave. It doesn't have to be extremely wavy. I just want a little bit of a texture. As I start to progress past the center block, the line will get a little bit larger as I go from the edge all the way to the edge. Again, traveling once I get to that point and then echoing my way back. What's nice about quilting wavy lines is I don't have to stress about making it perfectly straight. A nice gentle wave will do the trick. So even though that traveling is making the wavy lines look like it's going behind the block, what it's really doing is giving me a great transition point so that I don't have to keep going over the whole quilt. Now another thing to remember when you're quilting those large quilts on your sewing machine is that gravity is your enemy. We don't want any part of the quilt hanging down because you're not only fighting the quilt, but you're also fighting gravity. So reposition that quilt often, throw it up over your shoulder if you need to, whatever it takes to get that quilt finished, which is what I'm gonna spend the next few hours doing because this special gal is gonna love this quilt once it's done, or at least she better. So after we're done sewing, most quilters share their quilts or pictures of their quilts. Most quilted bedspreads take hundreds of hours to complete and it feels natural to share your hard work with others. Some quilters take photos of their quilts and share them on social media, while others give their handiwork as gifts. And others may display their quilts in their home or share in a combination of ways. Most quilters love showing off their hard work, even if it's not finished yet. Quilts can take months to make. 
I finished this baby quilt in 2016. Here are the quilts I'd hoped to finish during 2021 and a few I finished years ago. This is Construction Zone. I intended to donate this quilt to a local children's hospital and had challenged myself to make a simple quilt every month. This is my effort from January. The binding fabric is on the right side and when finished, the entire quilt will be bound in bright construction oranges and yellows. Waterfalls is a gift still in progress. It is a work in progress or WIP made in memory of an Air Force mechanic my husband worked with. Kiyoki was from Hawaii and rainbows and waterfalls seemed a fitting tribute to his bright spirit and friendly personality. He passed years ago, but he is still missed. This is Seeking Sensory Input. This UFO or unfinished object is called a scrap buster and was made of scraps from other quilts and projects I'd made. Each block contained four four inch squares. The fabrics have different textures and color schemes. The random combinations of fabrics reminded me of sensory stem objects for people with autism and that sometimes the stem objects may seem strange, but somehow it all works out. This is a tied quilt, meaning that it was not quilted with thread, but tied with string at regular intervals to keep the layers together. It will be finished with a blue ribbon to contrast with the soft pink backing. This is I Spy Elmo. I made this quilt for my daughter when she was two. I made it to fit her bed perfectly since she had just transitioned from crib to toddler bed, and that's a strange dimension. She still insists on keeping it in her bedroom years later. I used a pattern based on the golden ratio for my blocks and arranged the blocks in different configurations. My daughter enjoyed moving the blocks around with me and some ended in directions I hadn't intended. I pulled colors from Sesame Street puppets and used black as a contrasting color. This baby blanket has two layers, but is not technically a quilt. This project would be complete if my sewing machine hadn't malfunctioned. In summary, quilters love to share their work with one another. It inspires us to try new techniques and patterns. Quilting is a hobby that is always unique even though the process stays the same. This image is from Articulate Stock Images. In conclusion, quilting has existed for hundreds and perhaps even thousands of years and can be used in many different ways. Traditional or modern, patterned or freeform, this hobby can be utilitarian or artistic. It can commemorate historical events or celebrate the birth of a baby. And now a quiz. Question one, what object would you not need to create a quilt? Scissors, a glass of wine, or a knife? And the answer is a knife. Question two, can quilts commemorate historical events? True or false? Yes, they can. It is true. Select the true statements about picking fabrics or quilts. A solid color is usually used. Patterns can be large or small. Fabrics should be mixed and matched until you're happy. Hawaiian prints should be avoided. Solid colors are usually used somewhere in the quilt. Patterns can be large or small. Fabric should be mix mixed and matched until you're happy, but you can use any print you want. Question four, what are the layers in a quilt sandwich? Is it backing, batting, and top quilt? Basting, batting, and brownies? Top quilt, basting, and backing? or basting, backing, and brownies? Well, brownies weren't mentioned, so I can eliminate those options. And I don't, I think basting is a verb. That's a step, not a noun. So it's not that option. So it has to be backing, batting, and top quilt. Question five. 
Question five, true or false? A work in progress is the same as an unfinished object. And it is true. Da 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 da, 100%. I used a few sources for this lesson, for this course. Most of them are from the Smithsonian Institution, and the others are quilting websites. So thank you for joining me for Introduction to Quilting. I hope you learned something, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Take care.